Hey, uh, good afternoon. So I'm going to have a very broad talk today. I'm going to try and dive in into some of the things that we do in Chorus. Uh, what is conversation intelligence and how do we do it? So uh, I hope there's going to be something for everyone. So let's start with the big questions. Do conversations matter? Um, and what do we do at Chorus? So B2B businesses have a lot of conversations and most of their customer interactions happen over a conference line. Um, when you look at uh, these people that talk to customers, these sales representatives, we find out that 80% uh, of sales are made by 20% of the people. And the big question in sales is always how to replicate these top representatives and get more sales. Um, so if you look at the market of sales, it's, it's not a new market. We have many sales guru, consulting agencies, methodologies, books, and everything. Um, and some of the questions I'm going to try to answer today is how can managers coach effectively? Uh, what are someone's weak points when they're selling or talking to another person? Uh, can they teach themselves to become better at these conversations? Uh, so we aim to help people have better conversations uh, with the people that they speak to. So what is conversational analytics? Uh, we have the content side. Um, we want to help people find and share important moments. So we can, uh, with our system, help uh, a company find out all of the places where a customer is asking about uh, GDPR compliant. Is anyone here GDPR compliant already? Yeah. Yay. Um, 10 good answers to, to what is it. Uh, we can find what the best representative said and coach uh, the other people about what's the best way to answer it. Um, deliver call summary and key points automatically. Uh, we can say the next steps is, include sending you the white paper about our privacy policy, or the next step would be updating uh, our privacy policy by email. Uh, finally, we have live guidance. This means if the customer mentions security, uh, you can say that we are GDPR compliant. Uh, we want to whisper in your ear and, and give you some of that uh, guidance. Um, all of this describes what we can do for a person uh, who's doing sales. Uh, except for that, we can make all of the data in your organizations uh, uh, usable by other parts of the organizations. You are having all of these meaningful interactions with the users of your systems, with the customers and potential customers uh, of, uh, that you're selling to. And we want to help this uh, data go to the other people in the organizations. So marketing, product, uh, uh, decision makers need to know uh, what your customers think and want in order to make the best decisions. So we can see how many customers care about this uh, GDPR compliance, uh, when we're going to decide if we're going to develop it and maybe or maybe just, you know, block all of Europe like uh, uh, US uh, papers are doing now. So one side was content, the other side is sales craft. So one thing is knowing what the company you're working for is selling, that's the content. Uh, and then you have the general salesmanship, uh, which is something that people take from job to job, even if they don't know anything about your product. I don't know if you've ever been to one of these uh, uh, sales conversations uh, when you have a top salesperson who comes into the room, he doesn't know anything about what you're selling, but after 30 seconds, he found these top three things that the customer wants and he promises that. So that's sales craft. It has nothing to do with the, uh, what you're actually selling. Um, so we want to find and share important moments. I mentioned this before. In this case, we can say, hey, John is speaking for five minutes straight. Uh, it's normal when I'm giving the talk right now, but when you're having a conversation, uh, it's not as good. Uh, we want to help managers coach effectively. Uh, everybody in sales are talking about coaching, uh, but it's very hard to do that. It, it's time consuming, it's not always productive. Uh, so we want to uh, supply the manager, the sales manager, with 10 places where Jones spoke too long. This way they can have a productive short meeting uh, where they see uh, how to get better. Uh, we want to provide live guidance. So uh, in this case, we say John, enough. Uh, and we want to provide the representatives with metrics of how well they're doing. Uh, so this is a sort of a Fitbit metric. Uh, it's just something that you try to get better and you get uh, some feedback about how well you're doing. And over time, it's very uh, uh, um, 
effective, just like you get how many steps you did on your Fitbit, you can see how well you're doing with uh, 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 long monologues. So you have a problem with talking too long, and now you can see that you're doing better on 10% of the calls, and you keep up until you get to the number you want to. So does anyone really talk that much? Um, just so you understand what it looks like, this is a, a, a screenshot from our system. Uh, this is a conversation where this guy, Raphael Cohen, is presenting something to the customer, and he has a lot to talk about. You're going to notice that. Uh, it's like five minutes straight. The salesperson is keep trying to blink at me that maybe I'll stop and let the customer say something. But I had a lot of my, on my mind. I wanted to share it was important things that they needed to know, so I spoke for five minutes straight. When I go to this conversation afterwards, I can immediately see that I did something wrong, that the way that I uh, described our system uh, was not attentive to the other people on the call, and I, I can uh, do better on the next calls. So, um, what's Corus AI? Uh, a little bit about us. We record uh, quite a lot of audio right now, so we have uh, customers, we already recorded uh, some two, almost two and a half million conversations, and we are now calling ourselves the conversation cloud. Um, what's our medium? So you have all types of conversation. What we're having here is a conversation, uh, and, but it's not a sales conversation and you're not my customers. So we have more of natural speech. It's not lectures. Um, it's unscripted. This is not a scripted sales call uh, that you get from uh, uh, some other type of companies. Our companies do B2B sales, so they, uh, you know, they, they, what they're selling is usually valued. It's not something that uh, uh, salespeople uh, have to push onto their customers. Um, getting into the place where you are in a sales call for a B2B product usually costs you a couple of thousands of dollars to get the opportunity to do the marketing, to find the right person, uh, to qualify them until the, the representatives get into the, into the uh, uh, Zoom meeting with them. It takes a while and a lot of effort. So each of these calls matter. They cost a lot of money for the company to produce. And they're usually 10 to 60 minutes long. Uh, finally, we only do English for now, um, business reasons. So. What's the conversational analytics stack? Uh, first part, recording framework. Uh, this is actually essential. This is the table stakes. We want to capture all of your calls. We are going to uh, uh, look into your uh, calendar, find all of your uh, meeting invites, uh, and join them automatically, record them, transcribe them, and, and provide you the data. It's very important uh, to get everything because we want to have a good picture of all of your conversations. Uh, after we record them, we start doing interesting things with them. The first one is uh, live automatic speech recognition. So we want to be able to know what people are saying on the call. Um, separate the speakers. If I want to say that uh, somebody spoke too long, I have to know who spoke and how long did they speak for. Uh, so I have to know who the speakers are. Uh, finally, enrich the call with all sorts of interesting metrics, uh, like the conversation start point, uh, people that are habitually late to sales conversations, it may start 10 minutes later, there may be some chatter in the beginning. Hi, is anyone here? I don't know if you do a lot of conferencing, but that is usually how recordings go. Uh, but we want to help people when they review the calls to go directly to the starting point. Uh, we identify the topics, uh, extract the next steps, whatever you promised uh, that, that's going to happen next, um, identify risks. Uh, did the person say that they're having budget problems or is somebody missing from the call? Uh, all of that uh, uh, can be uh, identified automatically and communicated uh, to the managers. And finally, we want to look at a lot of calls at the same time, all of those conversations, recordings, uh, and provide insights. So, what do you need to do in order to provide all of those cool uh, insights? The first step is speaker separation. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go very deeply into that, uh, but uh, what we do is end-to-end -end, uh, speaker uh, separation and recognition. We want to be able to identify everyone who is on the call. And um, the, the most basic part of that, the most uh, uh, intelligent part, uh, is this part over here, the eye vector embedding, uh, which is the deep learning technology uh, which learns uh, what people sound like. So, 
given your voice, it can recognize you again, and given your voice, it can recognize the different people on the call and separate them. Um, how does this work? Uh, we have a data set where we know who spoke when, uh, and we train a deep uh, network uh, to embed each second of, of each call. And finally, uh, we try to predict who the speakers are, uh, provide a score for all of the speakers. After we did that, we actually throw away the, this entire nice network and we stay with the embedding because we don't care about the users that we already have in the system. Uh, we want to be able to uh, separate any call with any speakers. So we are left with the embedding system and this is what's uh, used here for every call, we embed every second of the call where people spoke, uh, cluster it to separate the speakers, and finally uh, try to identify who spoke when uh, using a whole bunch of features, starting from uh, uh, known users, the users who are paying chorus uh, have a voice fingerprint that we can match to and identify them, even if they are sitting five in a room, we can uh, separate each of them uh, differently and say uh, this is John, this is Jack, this is Raphael, like we saw before. Uh, we can take cues from the text, cues from the video, cues from uh, um, even you can take the lighting in the room and know that somebody is from a certain company because we can recognize the uh, meeting room. So you can um, enrich this with all sorts of information uh, to get the, the most uh, useful uh, labeling of, of who is speaking at which point. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the next step. Uh, we want to uh, do speech recognition. So we want to know what was said. The slide before was who said what. And I'm going to give you a crash course. So it's a light uh, uh, topic. Uh, I think two minutes would be enough. Uh, first, you want to take a recording and segment it into utterances. So uh, what the system does, it identifies these uh, one second to 20 second long uh, bits of the call where somebody spoke uh, and cuts them out uh, from the waves. Um, afterwards, we are feeding this into something called an acoustic model. So um, the acoustic model basically tells us, uh, I don't know if it's readable on your screen, uh, what were the possible uh, uh, phonemes uh, said in, in, in uh, during the, the speech. So we have, if I'm going to say uh, uh, daddy, we have da, d, and e. So we have three phonemes. And of course, the system is never sure what exactly was said. Uh, so we have this uh, beautiful lattice over here uh, with all the possibilities of what could have been said uh, when you say anything. Um, it's very important to uh, train this in domain, use the latest tricks if you want to have uh, good results for your conversations. Sales conversations are not TED Talks uh, and they're not uh, uh, live conversation that you record on the street. So each medium uh, you need to train a model for uh, in order to get the best results. So if you train in domain, you see about 50% improvement in error. Um, then, for example, taking just some kind of uh, speech API uh, that, that you find online, like Google or Microsoft. Finally, the, the output is this lattice of possible phonemes. Uh, and, and when people speak, I don't know if you notice that, we don't actually have spaces between the words. So I come from NLP, uh, where when you're looking at English, you usually have the words separated uh, by spaces. It's not the same in Hebrew, so uh, we have lattices in Hebrew as well, but uh, when people speak, there is no space between the words, so we have to take all of these phonemes and guess some kind of uh, uh, possible words that the people said. I don't know if anybody here has an Android, but you can, when you speak to that, you can actually see that edit in the sentence that you said while it's trying to guess the words. So it's, it's pretty good approximate if you're trying to understand uh, how it's working. And uh, we want to combine these phonemes into a word lattice. Uh, using a pronunciation dictionary. So we know that the word daddy has da and d and e in it, and we can take this path into it and say, okay, this could be the word daddy, and this could be the word uh, Danny, when we are looking at that. After we did that, uh, we can choose the best sentence using a language model. So, uh, uh, daddy, I love you is a good sentence, uh, while daddy, I, apple is probably not a, a comprehensible sentence. So we can guess from the words, uh, which is the most likely. Um, how do we do that? We use Caldi speech analysis suite. Uh, 
Uh, it's a hybrid of Python, uh, C++, Bash, Perl. Uh, so you can guess that it's not much fun to work with. Um, I mean, the Python for part is good, but if you have to change anything internal, uh, it, it has a cost. And, and what are we doing with it to guess the, the best uh, speech transcription? Uh, so I'm going to describe two projects here. Um, so one of them is the LM. I don't know, are, are there any machine learning people in the crowd? So some, uh, if you're reading what's coming out of Google, they're having these end-to-end -end systems which take all of these four things together uh, and do away with them and just have in and out. Uh, but in their papers, they describe training data sets which are huge, like uh, 100x of what we use uh, and with very similar results. So it's very, very expensive. Uh, costs a whole bunch to train and uh, you get the pretty much the same thing. So we, we are going to stick to the model that is currently working until, you know, they invent a way for that to really work and then we'll use that. Um, and the question is, how do we score the lattice? I mentioned that uh, uh, we are using an LM, but we have all of the possible words in the lattice. And this is a search problem uh, where we uh, use VDRB algorithm to go back and forth and decide what is the most likely thing given the data that we trained on. And uh, what we want to do is combine uh, recurrent neural network LMs uh, with the regular LMs, which are fast and uh, dependable, while running the same algorithm. Uh, the main challenges here are to train the right model. So we want to train model on good data. Uh, it's very acceptable for conversations to train the model with, uh, let's say, Reddit data, uh, but it comes with a cost. Uh, of people saying very, very uh, wrong things that you don't want the system to transcribe on mistake. Um, and so you better scrub your data if you want to get this, uh, uh, to get the best results. And you also want to make this to happen live without slowing the system down too much. So we actually want to keep the number of parameters we're training in the RNNLM down, uh, so this wouldn't be too slow. Finally, as I said, uh, this goes to the C++ part of Caldi. Not fun. Uh, next project. How long do I have? Okay, so I'm going to talk about this for two minutes and then uh, some results. Uh, so we said that we have a pronunciation dictionary which tells us each word, what kind of phonemes it can be made of. And of course, different people would pronounce similar words with slightly uh, different phonemes, especially if we have uh, Australians and British people and Canadian people and American people and Israeli people, Indians, whatever, uh, doing uh, uh, recording calls. Uh, so we have to be a bit flexible. And when you look at the most important words, which are not captured right, but when you take uh, an online API, uh, those are usually the out of vocabulary words. But uh, which words are these? It's actually their product name, uh, uh, competitor names. It's all of the words that they actually care about, that they want to search for. Because these could be weird names like uh, uh, Chorus AI is a single word or uh, anything like that. Um, so the solution is to have a custom uh, language model per customer where we are going to capture the words that they care about. And of course, to scale, we want to create this uh, automatically. Uh, identify what are the important words for each customer. And uh, what we're going to do is build this pronunciation uh, using, again, a deep learning model um, and train this in domain, as I said about everything. And let's take a one minute detour. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I'm going to recommend Dynet. Uh, so the nice people from uh, uh, Tabula gave a talk uh, just now about why you should use TensorFlow. So please don't use TensorFlow unless you're uh, like serving a billion users and have to update your model every five minutes. Uh, so this is a really nice, simple model. It learns, it reads everything, uh, all the, the possible phonemes, uh, all the possible words. So uh, we have a word like Underwood, and this is the dictionary for standard English, uh, which has a lot of weird names, but uh, weird stuff in it, like Selwyn, which I don't know name word. It has kibbutznik in it, I found out yesterday. Not an important word. 
uh, and we can see how it's pronounced according to the dictionary. So we have a ah and and there and wood, and for some reason under would come next to cheaters. Maybe it's uh, you know house of card thing. Um, I shuffled it, so who knows? Uh, anyway, uh, the model is really really simple. This is part of the fun stuff about Dynet. I just describe what the architecture of the network is like. So I, I'm telling it create a model. This is the encoder. Give me an LSTM. Uh, give me an attention uh, layer. Uh, give me a decoder and uh, softmax at the end. Uh, the attention is pretty easy to write. I just copied it from the Dynet blog. Uh, and finally, we train this. So for net, if you look up, so the good thing about Dynet, the code is really, really simple and it trains about 100 times faster than uh, TensorFlow for the same model uh, without uh, uh, requiring you to use expensive GPUs. Train it in domain, we're going to make this uh, open source anyway, but uh, uh, my point was that Dynet trains much, much, much faster for uh, LSTMs than uh, TensorFlow or similar. Uh, which makes it really easy to run experiments for cheap on Amazon uh, using Dynet. And the code is much, much nicer for uh, uh, people who like machine learning. You should probably wrap it up with rules uh, because there is no reason to make the model learn really hard things. So if you're a 10xer, you can turn this into a 10 and an X. Um, okay, let's just see what it looks like. So let's say we have a customer called Acme Corp. Once we uh, uh, allow this to uh, uh, learn the, the name of the uh, um, customer automatically, and this is a real customer, I just changed the name, uh, we can see that uh, suddenly we are capturing uh, uh, the name once it's learned it automatically, and the managers can go and say, uh, why aren't you mentioning our conference, uh, Acme Corp World, uh, and they can see when our people mentioning this in the call, they can find what people uh, registered for their conference and how was it raised in the uh, talk uh, during the conversation and see if the last minute really is the right place to uh, um, have it. So I'm going to jump to the end. We have lots of stuff about the actual insights, but we ran out of time. Questions? Yes. How did you get the audio? How did I get the what? The audio. The which stream? Oh, we, we have an agent which joins your call. This is the recording framework. And the format? Wave? Yeah, Wave. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, why isn't uh, the Dynet uh, popular like TensorFlow or uh, uh, PyTorch? Why is it? I ask you. All of you use Dynet, it would become uh, popular. No, but I mean, it's, it's very good for text and LSTM. It's terrible for CNNs. So if you are a vision person, don't use it. But you know, who needs vision? So anybody who wants to see the Dynet code, I'd be happy to share it afterwards. Uh, I heard that the talk afterwards is really, really good. Uh, so make sure you stay for it. Thank you.